One of them wanted to be the security guy. He claimed he was a security guy. Welcome to take two of Security Guy Radio. Yes, we had a little little false start here on that 4th of July. Uh, technical difficulties, but we're back on 4th of July. Happy 4th of July to everybody. And my special guest, thanks for coming in on 4th of July, Miss Tanya. Thanks for having me, Chuck. I appreciate being here. So uh, did I tell you about our uh, plans to go five days a week? I, I did ha- in the other show, so you can say yes, yeah, you told yeah. me. <laughs> but, but I only told you the first time. So we're going to go five days a week in Studio 3 because we want to keep up with current events. Things are just getting too crazy. Everything's crazy. And so we have five days a week. We can do a little news in the beginning, bring in a guest, that kind of thing. So we're excited about it. So I, I'm you know, super excited. You'll have to be on some of those days. Absolutely. All I'm right. knocking down your door. All right, good. Uh, what else is going on? Uh, we're going to uh, travel to, what is that? Oh, Black Hat. You ever heard of Black Hat, Tony? So Black Hat is the conference for all the hackers. Like the Black Hat. Oh, yeah. Right. And now that, Like the giant red book or whatever? Well, they're trying to work, you know, anonymous as a hacker, right? So they're trying to work more with the government on this to make them good guys instead of bad guys. And Black Hat has been around a long time, and it's really interesting because it has the best people in the world that can solve a lot of these problems we're having. And then there's another actual that day, there's a female. What kind of problems are we having, Chuck? All the attacks we have on our servers. Okay. You know? Yeah. Yeah, and, it's warfare. I mean, really, information is more important than, than uh, you know, bombs and bullets. That's what's going to bring us down if we let people take all our data. So that's going to be a fun trip. Then we're going to ISC West. We traveled a lot this year. Be on the road. And then we're working on our uh, our nationwide road show is going to be with a company uh, called Under the Shield. And they're a nonprofit that goes around and counsels police officers on stress. What's cool about it is it's not under HIPAA. It's not a medical counseling. Mm-hmm. So there's no stigma attached. And they're finding police officers and firefighters and first responders, military people are coming forward much more readily. And you're going to be there? We're going to go on a tour together. Fun. And go stop at police stations and say, hey, hey, what's going on with all these shootings and what's happened with the bad PR and let's fix it and, you know, kind of put a better light on what's going on, you know, out there in the world. So we're excited about that. But today we thought we'd talk about a very happy subject on 4th of July, a very patriotic subject, not. Uh, I've been trying to get Mr. Logan Clark on for a long time, and so it just so happened the calendar fell on today, the 4th of July. But So we're going to get this done because it's very, very important, and we will broadcast this several times because it's a very important show. And welcome Logan Clark of LoganClark.com. So Logan is the co-founder of the International Human Trafficking Task Force, among other things. And, and Logan, there's so many things you've done. Why don't you just lay it out for us? It'd be easier for us to tell us. Um, I've been in business for about 40 years. But I guess the main thing that I do that I've spent most of my life on is rescuing uh, women and children kidnapped, whether it be human trafficking, kidnapped, whether it be parental kidnapping, kidnapped for ransom, um, it just and, and it winds up being the majority of them wind up being women and, and children. And it's from various crazy people that seem to think that kidnapping is the answer to everything. Human trafficking is one of the worst scourges that we have in the United States. I've been warning people about it for 40 years. Um, I used to live in Southeast Asia and I saw it coming over from there and I knew it was coming. Now it's now it's really, really, really bad. Well, the um, the thing that's interesting is is that you know I, Chuck gives me like five minutes to prepare for these things. So <laughs> that's not true. I um, I read a little bit about you, and and I think that the assumption is, or at least for the the layman, is that it, these things do come from out of town. But you were just saying in the, in the pregame show that uh, that you could take me to some place in El Paso, and that Los Angeles is one of the biggest. Um, towns for this kind of trafficking, yes. which which is a shock to me. I mean, I love Los Angeles. I hate to think about that, but when I read the statistics, well, it's like six to eight hundred thousand people, right? Right. Most people think that human trafficking is in third world countries. That only happens over there. They're kidnapped, or the girls are come from foreign countries and they come here, which does happen, and that's the way it sort of began. Um, and. The, but back in the 70s, I guess. Um, but 
In the United States alone, it is estimated by the Department of Justice that 75,000 women a year are taken into white slavery in the United States alone. Wow. The average age is 13 or 14 years old. And we say 75,000 women every year from the United States. That's runaways that are grabbed off the street, suckered in. Um, it's kids that are kidnapped for human trafficking. Many times when you see on the news, you see these attempted kidnappings where a van, you see the, you know, the, the, odd killer, molester, et cetera, et cetera, that runs around and tries to kidnap kids and pull them into a car. Right. Whenever you see a van on the news, you see where a van comes and there's two trying, two people trying to do it and they're trying to abduct a girl about 14, 15, 16 years old and they don't get away with it. That is most likely human trafficking. That is not um, the freeway killers or the roadside strangler that's trying to get the girl in there. Most cases, that is gangs kidnapping girls to sell to human trafficking. Gangs are in human trafficking now. Um, it's an actual business. You can only sell a pound of cocaine once, and it's gone. You can sell a woman a thousand times. Wow. Well, and that's the thing that the U.S. Department does say that the, uh, the victims who are trafficked, 80% of them are female and children. Right. Sexual. 80% um, is sexual. 20% is labor. Uh, human trafficking. And there's a lot of human trafficking labor, uh, everything from maids to a lot of the sexual is brought over for labor, supposedly. They're brought over to be maids. They're brought over to be a waitress. Uh, they're brought over to be a model, et cetera, et cetera. And their passports are taken away. They're raped repeatedly hundreds and hundreds of times until they submit to just about everything. All their papers are taken away. But these, but, but the ones are grabbed right here in the United States. When these kids, the majority of these kids that disappear, they're not buried out in some grave somewhere. I'm not kidding. They are, there are some of them who are, but a vast amount of them are taken into human trafficking. They really are. They just disappear off the street forever. They're never found. Bones are never found, nothing. And those are taken in human trafficking. And they move them, with it. they're moved to two houses within the first couple of hours and they're moved to another state within 24 hours to safe houses and they're raped every single safe house they're raped repeatedly at that safe house until they find it by the time they get to the third safe house in the second state i guarantee you they'll do anything they want anything these are 14 15 16 year old girls and this is why we don't see them running away we don't see them showing up at the gas station calling the police because they're just brainwashed and out of it yeah. And you will see them come into stores. They always say, well, why don't these girls escape? They used to go, they would walk across the street to get candy, you know, or get juices at the liquor store. And then they go back into the wherever they are. The house, many times it's an upper class house that they're at. And they say, why didn't they say anything? They are so afraid. And in their country, when they go to the police, the police literally bring them back, like in Poland and in some Southeast Asian countries, a lot of them. The police will literally bring the person who came to them, the kidnapped person, and bring them right back to the kidnappers and get a bribe. So they know, like in the Chinese, know never to call the police, ever. Chinese hire private detectives like crazy. They never hire the police. In the Philippines, if your son's kidnapped, the kidnapped specialist team the kidnap response team knows where the child is but do you not call the police in the united states i mean what what happens here how do we handle it how do we handle no, it i here? think what he's We're saying not is that crooked here the cops here are not that crooked if you, you try to bribe a cop on a street here you're going straight to jail i guarantee you but i think there what maybe he's... some states you can get away but in third world countries you can open your wallet and have a 20 or 50 dollar bill there and they'll mm -hmm. take that and let you go so are you saying that Let's say let's do it with the twenty percent of people. Okay. The, yeah. These kids are kind of tricked under the guise of a movie stardom or a big job or something. Hey, come on over and we're going to get you a job. Turns out yep. it's fake, and that twenty percent of people are coming from countries that you know don't trust the police to begin with. There's other problems to begin with culturally, yep. and maybe they come over here. They just don't feel it's going to do anything after they've been brainwashed on top of it. You know, they don't realize, and they and they convince them here that the police. And sometimes they'll get a local cop that's involved in the East Coast or whatever, and that they'll see a cop come, or they'll see someone with a badge who looks like a cop, and they don't know. And he walks into the room, and he's real friendly. 
with all the bad guys. And so they know right away. But they have guys dress up in costumes as cops. But these girls from foreign countries have no idea. They believe all the authorities are involved in it. So but, you, you, I saw the yeah. movie Taken with uh, Ian Neeson, one of my favorite movies. It's a great movie. Taken? Taken, yeah. yeah. And you were telling us before the show that's based on a real story. Because I, I yeah. had a feeling when I watched it there was some authenticity there. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's not based on a real story. It's based on true facts. It's think, based, think, okay, uh, based on the trade. Okay. The only thing that's not true in Taken is the one guy hero. Right. <laughs> Liam Neeson. That's the only thing about that movie that is not true. The settings are true. The sale prices are true. The auctions are true for of ki- women. The kidnappings, the way they kidnap them at airports, all of that is true, factual. But there's no one guy. As many, I've rescued over 300 women and children. I don't do it alone by me kicking open all the doors and beating up 15 people, you know, as I barge my way into a, a safe house. Well, that doesn't happen. That's the movies. Now, here in the United States, I would think you'd have a much easier time to get law enforcement to cooperate. If you're overseas doing this, how do you do it? Well, they're just so melted into the... The kids are so brainwashed. There's a million kids a year that disappear. Runaways. A million kids a year in the United States. Now, 80% of those kids, 80 to 85%, are return home within the first three, four, five days. Okay. So you got 15% of those runaways still left. Of that 15%, let's say that 10% are stragglers. They get found by my partner, companies like us. We found many runaways and you get them back and they go to a program or they go to a lockdown or they, you know, whatever it is that they go to. There's still five, six, seven percent out there that never get found. What's five percent of a million? A lot. That's a lot of kids. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of kids that are out there that nobody knows where they are. And they are majority females and, and young boys, right? Prime takings for prostitution, for porn movies, um, you name it. And no one's looking for them. Well, that's, that's my question. So I was a cop for, I don't know, 13, 14 years back mm-hmm. in the 80s and 90s. And we had kidnappings. We had kids tr- missing. I don't think anybody ever once came to me and said, hey, w- let's look into human, like human, human trafficking, trafficking component. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I don't think ever got well, any it education was. It on was that. happening in the 80s and 90s. Well, I, I know. Was fighting it. So the question yeah, is it why. It's just no one wanted to talk about it. I actually went. Carrie Selig, who produced the Marilyn Monroe movie that's on right now, the miniseries that's on, it's just been nominated for awards. Her and I tried to get um, many times, many shows about human trafficking in the 80s and 90s on television. We went to them when Cops was the only one on the air. Yeah. And the networks, it would get, they go, oh, yeah, yeah, man. And, you know, we can do this and go in and get cameras and everything. And as soon as we got up to the network, as soon as we got to business affairs, and everybody and the real and the head producers, they went, oh, no, that's no, that that's really disturbing. We don't want to show that. Yeah, that's I, I, I worked in the movie business for 10 years. Uh, yeah, actually longer than that. When I was an actor, uh, I have some theories on that. <laughs> you do. I have some very big theories on why those people would not want those things on TV. I've seen some weird crap in the studios. Yeah. I'm not accusing anybody personally, but you know what I'm talking about, right? So I've been around the movie business all my life. Well, just like they don't like co- uh, oh, cocaine. Oh, uh, cocaine. No, we don't do cocaine. <laughs> yeah, you're the biggest <laughs> user to cocaine. I was under contract at Universal for three years. Yeah, it's crazy crap. It's so only I, four years. Well, makes and sense. And l- let's talk about that a little bit, because I, I saw the movie taken, although it was, you know, when it first yeah. came out, and, and all those girls were strung out on some sort of substance. So is that, par- is that part of the business as well? We've been talking well, about they- brainwashing and, and physical abuse, which is horrible. Um, but are they also stringing them out so that they're dependent yeah. on, on them Absolutely. for a certain amount of... Absolutely. The first thing they want to do is get them hooked on drugs. But they don't want to get them so hooked that they look like drug addicts because that's not good for the customers. All right, so who are the... It's just like they don't beat them up. They don't want to put bruises on them. They will use a coat hanger and you put a towel around a coat hanger. You take a coat hanger, a regular wire coat hanger, and you squeeze it together and you wrap a towel around the coat hanger and then you hit them with the with the towel and the coat hanger acts like a tuning fork and it vibrates inside that towel and so when you hit them it bruises inside it literally creates like a little shock wave inside their system like when the uh, i've been in prisons in foreign countries and they hit me with a phone book a thick phone book 
and they would beat me up with the phone book on my back and on my side and everything because the phone book would create a wave inside you and literally rupture you know, your intestines, but it wouldn't leave marks on you other than what looked like a slap. So why aren't people just, you know, Facebooking the crap out of this kind of stuff? Uh, and I, because bring, people don't want it up there. I'll bring people up the current example. On Facebook. Oh, we're going to stop gun violence by making guns illegal. And I keep arguing it's not that. It's violence that is the issue, not the gun. And violence is a uh, guns are a symptom of the violence, right? Well, I think in this, this is ca- far more violent. Well, well, yes, but far in, more violent. in this case, I think it's awareness, though, right? It's it's people aren't educated about this. They don't. They no don't one, know that. No one needs a fifteen or twenty five clip magazine or fifty clip magazine in the United States for hunting, for nothing. In California, having a fifteen clip magazine is like having a silencer. Well, go to I jail, go directly to jail. Do not pass go. Yeah, you don't I, need it. You don't need a silencer. You don't need a twenty clip magazine to hunt elk and no, deer and I, bear. That part I get, but what I advocate is that the all these issues are about violence and aggression, and aggression starts and out at a low level. Reloading has a lot to do with it. No, but I'm just talking about violence. Is just, what you're yeah. telling me now is uh, is the epitome of violence. I'd yeah. rather be killed if I was one of those victims than live my life like that for the next twenty years. True. Okay. That's ongoing violence. It's it's far worse than somebody come up and shooting you in the head. Well, yeah, that that's a that's a really good question too. Actually, like, what happens when they're done with these these women and children? I mean, they they must get worn out at some point. They they're not going to see no, them into the, into their retirement. I mean, what do they do with them once it is that they've decided that they're finished or that they're used goods and that they don't want them anymore? They dispose of them so that there aren't bodies laying around. The Mexican mafia cuts them up. In pieces and puts them in a 50-gallon drum filled with acid. And then they pour it out in the desert, uh, what's left. And then there's no bodies. If people were finding young girls' bodies all over the desert or all over the place that had been abused for years sexually, you'd create quite a panic. So there's no uh, dropping them off on a street corner and going, we're done with you. They, they, they literally no, dispose no, no. of them. No, 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 that'll they... backwards. That'll lead right back to them. You kill them afterwards. Unless they're unless they're still strong enough to become like a mama san, and run girls, some of them do that. The real strong ones will start to run the girls. They'll graduate from being one of the girls to being one of the one of the pimps, more or less, or runners. They'll keep control of the girl, and they do that just to stop getting beat and just. And they're getting older; they're not as wanted as much, you know. In this sick society that these people run in, um, once you're 22, 23 years old, you're too old. Wow. Now, uh, these what? are real perverts. These do, are real sickos. Do we see, uh, I'm going to say children because they're children, really. Mm-hmm. Do, we, do we see any escaping? And we had a couple on the news recently where that guy had held these girls for years. Remember, she oh, up, yeah, up north. Yeah, Maybe that's different than what we're talking about. It was think, an organized was, crime, right. but... Uh, do we see them escape, and does that help authorities busted? Do these guys ever get busted? Any of these big rings ever get busted? Some do. Up? Yeah, sometimes they do escape. Sometimes they get busted. Um, sometimes we will go in for a specific girl um, many times, especially around the world. Um, we will be after someone specific that we have been sent after, that we have been taken into it or we suspect, and we're hired by their parents or whoever. And we only want that girl, but we also want to take down the unit. Right. So and, we'll, we have different various ways. I won't describe how we do it um, so that people, you know, like our president does, describing everything. <laughs> um, but we have various ways and tricks of doing it. And we will get our one out, and then we will make sure that the thing implodes within itself. I'm um, here, I'm- or we'll turn it over to the police or whatever, but we will get our girl out. And if we can grab a couple of others, we'll grab them. But a lot of times you don't have much time. You Are the grab networks what you that, can and, that and, small, though? I know. mean, when I think about it, I'm thinking that there's a, a like a tribe of these women that they're trying to keep control over. Yeah, how, how, how small is a, a group? How, Ten girls well, to a... there's bars. There's, there's houses that are like um, whorehouses. I mean, that have rooms. There's six, seven bedroom, um, upper middle class houses 
where there are girls in every room. Sometimes, you know, there's rotations, there's houses where you can go in and pick the girls. We sat, we were on a surveillance, my partner and I, Alan Cardoza, and we were sitting on a surveillance one time, having nothing to do with human trafficking. And we were in Los Angeles and we were, we happened to be on a street where there were nine um, wedding dress shops. And it was downtown LA and there was nine of them in a row. And as we sat there watching, we're on something completely different insurance thing that we were dealing with. And um, we kept noticing that cars would pull up and only guys were going in the bridal shops. <laughs> no women. That's all a, that's a day long. The next day, guys, all day, how many men have you seen go into the bridal shop to help their wife pick up? That doesn't happen. Right. They don't, you know, there's hordes of women going into them. No women going into these. And we looked at each other and kind of just got a dumb look on our face and went, that's human trafficking. It's got to be. And they were going in there, there for, you know, 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, gone. Another car comes up and everything. And, it, and we reported it to the police and told them we became their surveillance. You know, while we were there to be able to tell them, identify the people, we got license numbers and everything else because we had a perfect place that we were sitting in a van. And that way, nothing had to be disturbed, and obviously, they didn't suspect us. And and who so we are, just kept them taking out license plates and who and are these else. men though? Who, who are the, who are the men that are involved? Like, is there a demographic? Is there a socioeconomic thing? That like, is it a certain? I mean, the buyers? Yeah, like who? Like are now, they the Johns a... are everybody. They're senators. They're um, I I knew Alex, the Beverly Hills madam. Um, I knew that whole group. Heidi, when she worked for the the Beverly Hills madam, um. But you're not They're, saying Heidi, um, Heidi Fleiss had, had girls that, that volunteered for this deal, yeah. right? I mean, she's, Those girls were not human trafficking. Those girls were high-class girls that were doing it for reasons they wanted to. They did it for two years or three years and put yeah. themselves through college or whatever. Um, that's way off of the of this scourge. Right. So who who wants these 14-year-old girls? I mean, who who is that? The customers are everything from politicians to professors to mechanics mm -hmm. um rich businessmen you can order um there are middle eastern guys that i know that that will put orders in for girls a blonde 18 years old blonde hair blue eyes and they'll actually make an order so will so will they'll do the same thing in mexico and get exactly what they want they're it's perverted but it's it's there's no um there's no uh, monetary system. There's no level of society that is that is not in it. Right. Um, the highest, the politicians, and from coaches to to anybody you can imagine that's in it. And and if if there wasn't the obviously if the if the desire wasn't there, if the market wasn't there, it wouldn't be such a big business. It's the same thing as drugs. You know, 80, 90 percent of the world's drugs come to the United States. This is where the appetite is. Now, how do you find you, – you bumbled onto that one downtown based on pattern. You had probable cause. The police could act on it. Let's say I, I, my daughter gets kidnapped and I hire you. Mm -hmm. How do you go about identifying uh, where she could have gone? Are there kind of known routes, known crooks in this yeah, business everybody kind of knows there about? there are known areas. There's known avenues that they travel. It depends on where in the country if your daughter's traveling around. Um, there are places that we've gone where we knew they were headed for a market, like in Tanzania. There used to be a huge slave market. Um, here, there's areas, there's pockets of areas where human trafficking are. Um, surprise, surprise, there, Glendale is. <laughs> Glendale? Glendale's a huge area. I'm glad you didn't say um, Burbank. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, now, are the girls going, I, I'm a little confused. These are Americans we're talking about. In general, I mean, this large population that go missing. But are, are they staying here domestically, or are they shipping those people overseas? No, they're moving them. They usually move them. They move them out of the state that they're from immediately, get them as far away. A lot of the times, it's kind of like a a, a marketplace. The, they bring the Nordics, the, the Western blondes and Nordic-looking girls to the Asian, to the Latin countries, because that's what they want. And they kind of mix them, literally mix them around. And they try to get them out of their comfort zone. They want to get them out of the state that they're in or used to being around, especially if they're 13, 14, 15 years old. That's all they've known. So they've got to get them to unfamiliarity where they're kind of lost. They don't know anybody. They don't know where to go. 
Same thing with the countries. Taking them from the countries, they're not all coming here. They're going to Japan's a huge human trafficking market. Huge. They buy them by the busloads. Or well, remind me not to go teach English over there. Well, I, yeah. No, those are, yeah, you always hear about and that. Hey, times, college kids, Because you'll get English. into trouble, Chuck. I'm going to be kidnapped. <laughs> I would be. Beautiful girl says, I'm going to go over and teach English in Japan. Really? Okay, who are you going to go teach it to? Oh, no, they solicited that stuff at my kid's college all the time. Well, uh, my yeah. nephew's actually teaching uh, English in Korea. It's scary, guys. But, you know, if it was a girl, maybe there's different angle on some of those things. That's weird. Yeah. It's scary. Now, that and the human trafficking and this and, and the terrorism are two probably of the biggest scourges, most dangerous things we have. Other, I mean, you know, the ecosystems, you can talk about all kinds of things, but human trafficking and terrorism are two things that are right in our face. Um, They're actual problems, the yeah. real things. And I'm wondering what it is. I mean, all, I am a little agog. I'm shocked about some of this stuff. It's, it, it is amazing yeah. that it's happening in such a modern world where we have such you know, options for communication. Sorry, And you've got to change the culture. You, a so lot how do we do that? How do we change the, the conversation, though? Like, what, what's your suggestion? How do we break this stuff up? Well, like, the, the human traffic, you kind of have to do both of them in the same way. We've got to... In, in human trafficking, it's the, the customers, it's the, the desire, you know, for it and, right. and everybody that wants it. We, you got to break that. And the only way to break that, I believe, is kind of the same way with the terrorism um, is you literally have to change the culture. If we, if we could get the Muslims, the, the vast majority of Muslims, right, the clerics, everybody, the one billion, et cetera, et cetera, who don't believe in this stuff to get up and shame it, denounce it, make it as bad as pedophilia, make I mean make it really and shame, and literally start shaming it in their own culture. If we could somehow have some way of affecting it in the United States, you that's the only real hope. As long as they desire 13, 14 year old kids, and there's ways to get away with it, they're gonna do it. As long as the supply is there, and the supply will be there as long as the demand is there. Always. Just like drugs. Now, let's talk about uh, the money involved in this, right? So you oh. told me about a bar. $38 billion it, dollars a year. Yeah, there's a bar in El Paso, I think you yeah. mentioned. And tell bar me, in El Paso. Tell me about that bar. I'll take you into, buy a $500 bottle of champagne, and they will bring us a 13-year-old girl. And that's going on today still? Mm-hmm. What, how come, what, I mean, Texas is pretty conservative. Why don't somebody go in there and just get rid of it? Um, they, they, they do it, it, you know, it's, they, not anybody could just walk in there and do that. You know, you've got to have an un- undercover situation. So, yeah, that's, be in the, club. that's yeah. the other thing too, is right. So, so it's like, it's like you have to know the knock or the password Absolutely. in right. order to, in Absolutely. order to get this it's sort all of done, Just like drugs. I mean, you know, it's all, although, you know, there's, they sell those pretty openly much more than women. Now there's that, that, uh, is it NAMDA organization? What the National Association of Boy Love uh, Associated or something like that, right? Yeah. Would you would you put these people into that same kind of category? I mean, it, it's all yeah. kind of, you know, very similar, right? Yeah, very. Now what? They belong right along with uh, ISIS. <laughs> right, but there that organization and and I did a little investigation on that when we were police for something, and uh, you know that's just a big database of people that belong to this club that think it's all okay, and it's a lot of pretty mm-hmm. well-to-do, affluent, you know, people that got the money. So perverts like company. Well, and it costs money, right? So I'm, I'm yep. wondering if this is a business that is cost prohibitive for some poor guy uh, who works at McDonald's flipping hamburgers and can't afford it, or is this really driven by upper uh, middle class and or rich people that can afford this kind of thing? I mean, what what was the cost to rent a girl for an hour? I don't, you know, I'm just wondering. Uh, they th- have them. It all fits the society. I mean, they have it in the barrios. It's Oh, it's $50. everywhere. Okay. Yeah, you know, right. $50, you know, $20. And in the nice places, it's $500, $1,000. It's whatever the market will bear. All right. Literally. So it's really not catering to rich people then. I kind of, I was under the impression that maybe that's what was going on. That- no, there, there is a elite, there is a elite class of rich people around the world. Well, yeah, you mentioned senators before. I mean, that's, you know, you mentioned kind of higher up yes. level of, of people who, you know, have a certain amount of privilege, and and so I Absolutely. I just made that leap that you know that's that's who they were servicing. Yeah, and they can go into clubs like Taken, and they can actually 
see a slave market. They can see the girls paraded in front, and they have they actually have auctions. So you got to wonder uh, in, in legislature, uh, in our enforcement, that you know people that don't go after this stuff, maybe they're involved in it. I don't know. I mean, you don't find a pedophile on an oil rig in the middle of the Ivor Sea, okay? It's, you just don't. <laughs> right. Right? I mean, right. they're right. by schools, and we're all surprised. Oh, there's a pedophile in the school. Really? You're surprised by that? I mean, that's where they go, right? And then right. you see a lot of denials on things. And there was a senator busted a couple of years ago for some yep. young boy underage thing, or I think it was. And uh, coaches and Boy Scout yeah. leaders. And I mean, not that that's where pedophiles go. Right. They go to where they can be around children. Now, are they? And pe- everyone's all aghast when I, they I, hear that. I did a show uh, about three or four months ago with some clinical psychologist, and we did one on pedophilia. And did you see yeah. that one? It's really interesting. You should watch it. Uh, the definition of pedophilia to you and I is not the same as a clinical diagnosis. It's not the same thing. We think if you have sex with a kid, that's pretty clear. But there are people that like kids, are attracted to kids, are sexually stimulated by kids, but if they never touched them, they're not classified as a pedophile, which mm-hmm. is odd to me, right? Mm-hmm. So are, are these people pedophiles, or well, are no, they sexually like, violent predators? I mean, what is their, their makeup on this? I mean, legally, I guess it's a pedophile. I think it's something way beyond that. I, well, I, I, no, it does make sense to me, because just because you, th- you think about it and— you know, you don't go through with it. I mean, you could say that about a lot of things. It's like, oh, well, you know, I thought about cheating on my wife, but I never have. So are you a cheat? Well, that's a good point. But I mean, the, the psychology and it behind on this, the opportunity. Yeah. But I mean, are, is there something more beyond pedophilia here that, that I'm missing? Because you have that slave component. It's not well, typically what Well, in this particular, a, yeah, in this particular, saying? it's, it's like you've you got to be really... It's like a commodity, right? They're seeing it like a steak. You just right. go you just go and order right. it, and then yeah. you have it, and so, you're you're full, and then you go on your way. Well, a lot of pedophiles way. claim uh, that they love kids. And they probably do in their sick, twisted yeah. way, right? In their, in their own mind, yeah. Right, and a lot of pedophiles don't kill kids. Right, they well, there's, molest a, there's them, right? definitely psychology around that. Yeah, some weird stuff here. specific. Yeah. I, I just think if you Absolutely. think you can take a slave, you're kind of effed up in the head. I mean, you're way beyond... <laughs> What anybody well, there's a certain am- there's a certain amount of ego involved in that, right? Like, oh, I can just go oh, out yeah. and buy and buy sex for in whatever variety I would like, and I'm just gonna, you know, and and the fact that that is so appealing, that it's become a, a thing where you know hundreds of thousands of people are being trafficked. Right, and a lot of that, and, and not a lot, but some of that comes from husbands who won't won't say to their wives what they want to do, and then they'll go do it with a prostitute. So, they, so you feel like there's a certain level of shame that's tied to these purchases? Like they, they're, they're trying to some, keep it undercover yeah. because they have certain appetites that are not being fulfilled? Some of it, absolutely. Now, how much violence is involved in, in this? Uh, I mean, to me, in it's, human it's trafficking, violent per se, right? But in, if they're buying girls, are they beating girls up? Are they you know, killing girls or any kind of weird no, stuff like rape, that going on? They're, they're raping the girls right. repeatedly. To break down their morale, absolutely break down and make them totally submissive. These are the traffickers They're, you're talking about, right. not the Johns, right? Right. But afterwards, there's there's violence in anyone who tries to stop them. There's violence in anyone who tries to escape. There is violence in when they are done with the girls. Well, and I read this interesting thing, too, about how they, they're not given medical care, really. So they feel all this pain. They're, they're, they're abused well, in they this have, way. Well, they, they and have, then... have abortions. Oh, yeah, they give abortions. They have somewhat of doctors um, with them that give abortions or force abortions so that the girl can keep working. But not to take care of their, their overall health. physical health. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Well, they don't want them getting diseases because that's bad for the business. But So they take care of what's necessary so that they look, look proper and they're clean in the sense that they're not, you know, the customers aren't getting diseases because that's bad for business. You know, I, what is, what part does technology play in this? This huge. This, I mean, can it we? Has, can just we... like the borders coming down. When the Berlin Wall came down, drug trafficking, human tra- human trafficking went nuts. When Euro, when the Euro came in and all the walls came down, it became so easy to traffic in people. That's where it went from a few million to thirty million. Is because of the internet and because of borders going down oh, and yeah. easy to cross. No passports, no nothing. And imagine before trying to go from Poland all the way through the European countries to get to the United States or wherever, right, that you want to get to. And each country you have to go through a border. 
You might be able to buy or con your way through one border, but four of them, highly right. unlikely. And we caught more people back then. Is that what Absolutely. you're saying? Absolutely. Caught them all the time. Oh, and interesting. The, the, the urge to do it wasn't even there in such, in such mass because it was insane. It was just too many borders, too many stops. I had to go through those borders when I was doing kidnappings because we would sneak in. We traveled the same routes, the same gutters that the bad guys did, whether we went to Afghanistan or Sudan or Yemen. We crossed the Red Sea from Djibouti, Africa, in a 36-foot boat and snuck up on a beach in, in Yemen wearing burqas, wearing complete black guys. British Navy SAS, <laughs> SEALs, and us coming up in women's I burqas like and I coming like up it. on it waiting for a Toyota. Because no one will walk up to you. Nobody will say a word. Right. They're not allowed to. So you can walk down the street and people will just walk right by you. They don't even look at you. And plus, you've got the whole mask on. Now, this is a good argument for the uh, pro-British exit people, I must say. I think, I, think, I, I think I get a check in that column for that one. Nobody's going to argue that, all right? Now, let's talk about the technology for the sales now, okay? Are, do we have mobile apps that sell this kind Internet, of stuff? Yes. Or, now, the dark web. Okay, the dark web, right. Now, why yeah. can't we, with all our technology, go find all these things? We can go find them. It's technically possible. There's plenty of hackers I know that can find but things. We do, and, and we do it in, in places, but... The dark web gets darker and deeper, and it gets more difficult for us to break into it. And also, with uh, people like Snowden, well, what the metadata, metadata that that stopped did tremendous damage to this country, no matter what anybody says. I've worked with the NSA. I've worked with every government agency throughout my life. That I know what, what they're doing. I know and they're in Italy and the bases. That screwed up our country's intelligence mass mass amounts well, and every time this this privacy you know i say bullshit and a lot of times because of the terrorism because of everything that's going on we have so much paranoia about our privacy that we are we are keeping the authorities and i know the whole argument about but that's where it begins and rada 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 we got a, we got a couple of really terrible things happening, terrorism, and and human trafficking, and they got to be stopped. Now, they how stopped. are the terrorists in this business yet? Because I know they're in other businesses. They're in pirating. They're in all kinds of things to raise money. Uh, are they? Oh, yeah. Are they into this? Tons of them. Are, through human trafficking, though, are they in that biz? Or is through this... human trafficking, yeah. through drugs, through gun sales, through people in Saudi Arabia that send them millions and millions of dollars. Now, who? Court. Who are the who are the main uh, gangs involved in this? I mean, are these uh, Russian gangs? Are they you know the Russian mob? Some of them I wouldn't go into, uh, but uh, yeah, the Russian mafia is um, Russian mafia makes the Mexican mafia look like Boy Scouts. Well, that was a crime when I was a a, a cop uh, in the eighties. Yeah. Russians had just started moving into West Hollywood. A lot of Russian organized crime back then. Yeah. serious serious stuff. But, so this, but, yeah. this sort of, but this sort of organized crime? I mean, this is... No, no, just all kinds of other things. I mean, I, I didn't identify that specifically, but it was it was a problem back then. And, you know, the, oh, who's this guy? Well, he came in on an, Armenian an air conditioning the, visa to prepare air conditioning. huge Armenian yeah. mafia. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and runs in Glendale. And it's a monstrous Mar Armenian mafia, and they're involved in human trafficking. And there's different... I mean, everybody's, everybody's got their own mafia now. Well, the yeah, Irish started. Yeah. We were the original, by the way. Well, it's true. Yeah. We're the first gangs. And they're all trying to outdo that heritage. Yeah, I know. Yeah. tries to outdo Al-Qaeda. Gangs of Seattle. The gangs try to outdo each other, and the mafias try to outdo each other. It's just... Well, people people are naturally competitive, right? Um, yeah, I guess so. I, I have a question. I mean, we've been talking about this very serious subject, and I'm wondering if you uh, would recommend or partner with any of the organizations that are trying to stop some of this stuff. Like, I've been reading a, a little bit about the Polaris Project. Mm -hmm. I know that they kind of work with um, with people to get you know, at risk teenagers yep. and women. Um, is there, is there, I mean, there are some people that are sort of shouting from the rooftop that this thing is happening. I understand yep. that this is all very taboo, but is there some, somebody that you work with that's actually doing good work out there that we can, we can look at and support? Um, yeah, the, uh, the dream it's in LA. Okay. Um, so, huh? Go ahead. I'm sorry. There's the dream. It's not the dream fact. My partner works a lot with him because he works with at risk. Um, youths, and he's a, a counselor. He's on the uh, California Juvenile Judges Panel. 
Um, but there are organizations that go around all, all over that are, are wonderful organizations fighting human trafficking. They, um, they went into uh, Cambodia for, they were just telling me that they had been in Cambodia so many times and breaking it up. And every time they broke it up, the, there was so much corruption, they were taking the girls right back to the exact same village and it was just, they literally left Cambodia and said, we can't, there's so much government corruption here, we cannot make any effect. And they left the country. And it took about two years before the country invited them back and said, please, you know, we'll cooperate any way we can. Um, there are some organizations, unfortunately, I don't have the names of the ones off. I should have gotten a list from my partner. Um, but well, yeah, okay. there are we, some yeah, very that's, solid that's okay. organizations. Chuck, will, Chuck can uh, look into it. And so let's let's talk about enforcement. So I'm All rusty. Right. I'm rust enforcement. I'm rusty on my penal code. OK. But basically, you got like you know three fourteen, which is uh, you know a basic sex crime, and, mm -hmm. and and a lot of people register as sex offenders, and and I'm wondering if all these crimes still fall under these basic misdemeanor slash lower felonies. I mean, rape's not a low felony, but you know, child molestation. I mean, do they do they win when they get caught on things like that? Uh, what, it, it, I, it depends I, on the state. It really depends. Yeah, it does, on the right? State. So that's a problem. Yeah, Tanya. So each state, state has a different yeah. view of what right. the crime is, right? Well, and and the age of consent changes in every state as well, right? Right. right. It changes yeah. in every state. Um, so yeah, if they're, they're going to do a couple years in jail and get caught, it's worth them to make a million dollars a year and get out two years later. I mean, I could see right. that. Well, they right. the Dottie Lassiter, my partner um, in Texas, she was trained by the DOJ, and she got a, a law passed that. If you're convicted of human trafficking, it is a mandatory 35 years. Well, that's what we need. There you go. Prison. But they're not enforcing it. Why? Cops on the street. They're, they and the DAs, they just, they treat them like just a normal pimp. And they wind up getting six months and they don't, I guess, because of the overcrowded jails and everything well, else. that's part of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it is, but it is supposed to be a, there is a law on the books that if you are convicted of human trafficking, it is 35 year mandatory. The judge has no say so. Mandatory sentence. Well, that's and almost ridi be. that's ridiculous that's too because you get this the the pimp that's just got a couple girls. He's he's you know talking about them, saying, "Oh, I love you." He's mm -hmm. psychologically turning them around, but he's taking care of a couple of girls at a time is not the same as running a whole network of of these women and children no. who are being and those and those pimps usually the pimp on the corner those girls are all of age but the, what makes a human right. trafficking what, what turns the pimp into human trafficking immediately is if it's an underage girl right so we should have much more severe penalties for people who are actually networking these ladies than you're just you know, not that pimps Absolutely. should get off the hook well I mean saying. you got to get the DAs to prosecute yeah. it's like parental kidnapping I was the in that system a long attorney time will not prosecute and we've had two DAs on our show, remember? Mm, yeah. Right? Yeah. And, you know, 90, what did she say? 95% of the cases are plea bargained? Yeah. Of you remember? Yeah, They're Archuleta. Plea, and yeah. they don't take cases, Chuck, that, that they, they can't win. They don't win. That's right. They don't the want a case. Right. In elder abuse, Casey Kasem. Well, let's talk about oh, that. I had yeah, so about much that. evidence against Gene Kasem. Well, tell it. Tell everybody what that, yeah, tell, tell us the whole story. Tell us about one. the case. Yeah. Yeah. I had so much evidence of elder abuse, of, of massive abuse to this man by Gene Kasem. She, everything she did, she pulled him out of the home. He was, they had a feeding tube in him. The nurses said, this is at two o'clock in the morning. The nurses said, you can't do that. You can't remove him from here. He's got a feeding tube in him. She said, okay, I'll take the machine. And they said she can't live without that machine, so she stole the machine. Now, it started. Uh, she started. literally did stole the machine, put it in the, one of the two Toyotas they had, took off on a three-day trip to Vegas with a man who was dying, right? Who's got a feeding tube? They ran out of food for the machine, hooked up to the feeding tube, stopped by a CVS and bought Insure, and poured Insure in the machine and jammed it, jammed the machine. Then drove him to Vegas, put him in, got two suites, three suites in Las Vegas at the Vidara Hotel um, under Liberty Kasem's name. And I don't, partied in Vegas, I guess. And then got a private plane. And this, I'm not, I guess they did. I mean, I, I'm the detective that found him. 
And then they got a private plane. They flew to Washington. She basically killed him. She took him on a road trip, which he had no business doing. I asked the police. I said, she stole. They said, well, she didn't kidnap him because it's her husband. Well, and you collected okay. all yeah, the evidence against this? Still and... kidnapping. Right. But I said she stole the machine, the feeding machine, that you can get her on that. And they said, well, no, actually, she didn't steal it. They gave it to her. I said, what do you mean they gave it to her? Gave her 50000 Under threat machine. of yeah. death, they gave it to her. And literally, the cop told me that. And he said, well, they gave it to her. And they allowed her to take it. And I said, okay, so you're telling me if I go into a bank and I walk up to the teller and say, and I open my coat and I say, I want $5,000, and, and they see my gun, and they decide to give me the money, I'm not taking it. They're giving me the money. He said, don't be an asshole. <laughs> That's what the cop said to me. I said, look in the mirror. Now, listen, this stuff goes on. I had an uncle, a very successful guy, you know, Air Force, astronaut program, business guy, Mr. Bachelor, great guy, great guy. And he got started getting dementia. He winds up in a nursing home in uh, what's that, what's that city above San Gabriel? Real expensive city. Uh, I can't, San San Marino. San Marino. Okay. Right? San Marino. Yeah. This place is six thousand dollars a month. Okay. Yeah, and, it, those and, kind of facilities are expensive. He can afford it. It's a beautiful place. It's a nice place. Uh, he picked it ahead of time, thinking you know he's going to be well taken care of. Well, it turns out uh, I come in there one day and uh, he's not being fed. Well, why isn't he being fed? His girlfriend says, oh, well, because he spits it up. <laughs> okay, well, that's too bad. You right. still got to feed him. Keep at it, yeah. And I had no standing because I wasn't on the power of attorney, and yep. I'm just a nephew, and blah, blah, blah. And basically, they starved him to death, all right? That's basically what happened. And he had diabetes, and I said, you can't stop feeding him. He has diabetes. Well, it's messy. He can't keep his food down. Put a tube in. No, the yep. doctor decided this. All right, so I know this crap goes on, all right? And, and yep. I went to the police the and time. said, you know what? I kind of think that's a uh, homicide. If you don't feed somebody that you're charged to feed, yeah. right? Well, you know, that's a civil case, blah, 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 blah. I'm yeah. still fighting this. I'm still trying to get somebody to look at this. Really? And, and the DA won't listen to it. No. it. The analogy is, if you're my child and I just stop feeding you and you die, I'm going to jail. Yeah. And just because it's right. an older guy not. in a hospital bed doesn't mean he can stop feeding him. Right. They would call that child abuse, right? Yeah. And, and we don't have yep. euthanasia in California, do we? Exactly. I don't think so. I mean, it's not technically And they legal. do not do anything about it. They're not going to try the case. Right. And if they would if they would have if they would have charged Gene Case and I said, if there's ever a case book study of elder abuse, this is it. This is the case book study. And I said, you've got to charge this woman to the district attorney. You have to charge her, even if you can't convict her. You've got to start somewhere. And they said, no, we don't. We don't take cases that you know unless we know that we can't unless win. Unless we know right. we can get a conviction. And so, is this what's happening as far as the trafficking? Then it, it's that they feel like they can't win these cases. The network is too big. They're not getting. They're on not human trafficking. Make it. They yeah. must feel that they can't get human trafficking, so they'll settle for six months or three years. And three years, you get out in one. Yeah, that's yeah, my point. The lesser included crime. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But Texas is unique in this 35 year law. There's not other states that have that, right? Oh, it's a federal law. Oh, it's a federal. federal. Yeah. Oh, boy. 35 years for human trap. But I would imagine court. that you have to really prove it. But like, they it would do be not, the same yeah. as they breaking do out. Not. And usually they arrest the women, <laughs> the ones that mm -hmm. are here, especially if they're from foreign countries. They've been brought over here. They think they're going to be a maid. They're raped. They're used in these houses and everything. Then the cops come in and arrest them. For being prostitutes happens all the time Dottie my partner tears her hair out she has to fight for weeks sometimes months with the police department and she gets to the Department of Justice to help her literally she says these are not prostitutes right they're being girls came here to be made you idiots they're being victimized twice yeah basically. Right. they right. need to be you know they need to be retrained they need to I mean they need to get right. their lives back they're well, assuming the cops are assuming they have free will yeah. and another thing you know what these guys do well, the reason these girls don't run Chuck this is really important when I was doing the the cases many, many times, They what they do with the girls, they'll get the girls, they've got the girls, and they rape them. They're trying to get them to, to acquiesce to it. They will show, if one of the girls is talking about running away, they will show them a photograph of their younger sister in Poland. And, and I've actually seen these and actually had caught guys that did this. They show them a photograph. They go, see the picture there, of your sister? And these girls can hardly speak English. And they go, yeah. And see the man standing there, and they have a guy in Poland 
walk up, you know, walk by and say, excuse me, can you tell me what time it is? And they'll touch him on the shoulder and a guy across the street takes a picture, right? And they're touching this younger sister on the shoulder, you know, just asking her what time it is, an innocent question on the street. They then take that picture and they put the crosshairs of a gun, right, on their sister. And they go to see the man who's touching your sister. Then the door opens up and that guy walks in the door. They go, that's how close we are. Mm -hmm. You can run away and you'll probably make it. You'll get away. You'll get away from us. And we will go get your younger sister to replace you. And they do it. And they do it and tell all the other girls and show all the other girls that they do it. Now, you think those girls will, especially third world, their younger sister, they'll do whatever these people want not to go after their younger sister or to kill their father. How many cases have been prosecuted on the federal level that you know of? How many what? Federal cases have been prosecuted for this. That, that law you told us about, that's federal law for 35 years? Yeah. Do you know if been prosecuted? I'd have to ask. You ought to get Dottie Lassner on here. Um, she could tell, she works directly with the Department of Justice. She has gotten to a talk few to her. through, but it would be really interesting. I doubt that there are very many 35 year sentences. I think we'd hear of one of them. Any right. of them. Yeah. Right? You sure would. I mean, yeah. it would be you a sure huge, would. it would be a huge thing for, for the movement to hear of something yeah. like that. Well, that it would... impresses people. The law, the, the, the politicians get to go see what we did. 35 years, mandatory sentence. Okay. Now well, we I mean, there was a little vacation. bit of that. The guy yeah. who, uh, the guy who did all the subway ads, who lost all that weight, he was, he was actually going across state lines oh, yeah. and got like 25 years for something very similar. Yep. For, and that, that and that was a huge, that was a huge thing. It, yeah. it, it but got you see, publicity. but he's the poster boy because he's a known celebrity where the bad guys <laughs> that are organized crime, are kind of not. I, I, listen, I filed cases with the FBI with a five inch binder and a bow on it that says, here's all the check stealing. Oh, it's not over a million dollars. I'm not going to take it. But they I just have weird criteria for things. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bonfire of the vanities. You ever read Bonfire of the Vanities? <laughs> read that. It explains all this nonsense. It's a bunch of crap. They want to be sure. They care about, they care about convictions. They care about winning cases. And that is what they want. And uh, law enforcement, unfortunately, and, and I'm not down on law enforcement. I think they're underpaid. It's a, it's a, a hopeless job um, or thankless job. But um, law enforcement now, because of politicians, law enforcement is no longer in the job of solving crimes. They're in the job of closing files. No, I agree with that. I totally agree with that. Well, I think that, yeah, all of that stuff has become sort of a, it's become a career, right? It's no longer a, a civil service. It's like a, it's a career that you have. Right. In your how, many, how many files you got closed? Yep. Yeah. Now, here, here's something interesting. We, and I, I wrote an article about on this, uh, 2005, I called it, How to Catch a Terrorist Without Hurting Anybody's Feelings. And if you Google that, it's on CSO Online. It's been all over the web. How to Catch a Terrorist Without Hurting Anyone's Feelings? That's the name of the, the, the article I wrote, right. <laughs> all right? I and, love it. And so the premise behind that was, you know, let's bring back probable cause, right? There's PC for political correctness, but there's PC for probable cause. And in California, you, as a police officer, you and I can arrest the same amount of people. You, if you see something, you can put them under citizen's arrest just as powerful as I do. My distinction is I can arrest you if I think you have or are going to commit a felony. Whether you did it or not, I can arrest you. You can as a citizen do that, right? Now, the reason for probable cause arrest is here's a simple scenario that I've actually arrested people for. Driving down the street, 3 o'clock in the morning, I stop a car for red light. The back seat are brand new tires. Brand new tires. Four back tires stuffed in the back seat of this big old car with broken glass all over them, right? <laughs> and the guy's got a crowbar in the front seat, and he's got some blood on his hand. And I arrested him for what? Probable cause. What, I, what, right, do, you, what for, do you think I arrested him for? For stealing, yeah. stealing car yeah. parts. So you as an average citizen go, that sounds reasonable. Right? Because I yeah. just told you, okay, he had window smashed a tire store. Turned yeah. into a big pursuit. We actually caught him. So he went for probable cause, even though he didn't have a victim then. I think what we're missing, Logan, is this. We can interrupt terrorism more effectively. We can interrupt human trafficking more effectively. We can interrupt all these things if we let the police do what they used to do, which is be nosy. I always tell my neighbors, right. if you see something that's terroristic, don't call the FBI. But I think the temperance the of police. police officers are not, they're not curious anymore. I... I I'm going to agree with you on some of the younger people I've met. Uh, us old timers, we love this stuff. Yeah. It, these are these are legal documents that you have to persuade people with. Yep. You had to, and by the way, you just didn't do it uh, because you thought he didn't do it because that's a big deal, and you you had to write that report very specifically, right? And lay it out. 
Yep. And then the DA would get it. And you had, I think, you know, 24, 48 hours to go find the store. We found the store in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then we said, yep. okay, you were arrested on probable cause. Now we found the store. So how about I pick up one of these human trafficking pedophile idiots and say, you know what? I think this is human trafficking. I got 48 hours to go. I think when you interrupt these things, interrupt yes. the terrorist in the act, interrupt the pedophile, you're doing a good job. You're helping Absolutely. keep it down. But we don't Absolutely. interrupt. But there, All but, we care but about is... Say, oh, yeah, but it won't hold. Well, who cares? All we care about now is is catching and a successful prosecution or interruption. Yep. And I don't think anybody's going to argue with me that if a Florida cop had probable cause to stop that asshole in Florida, in Orlando, and stop him, then anybody would argue with that probable cause arrest, right? It would yep. interrupt his act. Maybe he'll yep. come back. Maybe they'll keep doing what they're doing. But eventually, when you interrupt things, it stops. And we see this in, in the FBI interrupting terrorist plots now. Yep. They, if they can't arrest him, which is what they said for the Orlando guy, well, we couldn't arrest right. him. Well, interrupt them. Who cares if we arrest them? Yeah, so, you know. exactly. So I, th I think we could we could do a lot if we educated people on, on those kind of things. Instead of saying, well, it looks like a penal code, uh, child molestation penal code, I'm writing up for trafficking, and, you know, you go prove it's not trafficking, and we'll get some evidence on it. So yeah. I, think, I think this is the part we're missing in, in the whole war on terror and everything. A lot of times what we have to do is put that we will go and go undercover, go into the bars, and we're after, you know, uh, a particular person, but we'll go in and set the whole case up and literally tie it up in a bow and hand it to the district attorney or the, the FBI and say, look, here it is. We don't want the caller. We couldn't care less about the credit. This is the girl that we want. That's all we want. You can have the whole bust, all the credit for it. Just make sure we get our girl out. Now, do you get cooperation when you hand it to them like that? So, yes, absolutely. Yeah. If we go to them and we have what they want, if we go to them and ask them for questions, ask them what they got, we won't get shit. That's right, right. But if we go, I got a whole bunch of stuff and I want to give it to you, they go, yeah, come on. Yeah. Well, <laughs> then that, right put, on in. that puts it in private hands again then, right? Because yeah. you're, you're a yeah. private citizen going... People have to, yeah. yes. Which People brings me to my to main premise of my whole reason for being alive is that the government can't do jack about anything. <laughs> it's individual responsibility. Uh, it all comes where, down to that. I knew People that that's where we were going. have to get involved. Yeah. Same thing with the, the terrorism. The Muslims have to, all the, to the alleged good guys have to get involved. They've well, got to get involved and say it's happening next door. I know what, they recognize it. They know damn well what's going on down right. the street. They yeah. just don't want to get involved. Well, and, and you may not know this in, in basic, basic, that's a terrible thing to say, but uh, w travel and station cases that are not trafficking, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. uh, Logan, get me, my number might be wrong, but it's, you know, 90% of the parents, one of the parents know the other parent's doing something. Yep. Right? And they just yep. turn around, they go, well, I'd rather hey, be married hey, than they're not. They're in denial. They're in denial, yep. right. And, th yep. and so... It's or trying, or they feel that they need to work it out within the family, or you know. So if you see your neighbor and you like your neighbor and you suspect the him or her of doing something, and then you go, oh, but they seem to be, you know, there's nothing, there's mm -hmm. nothing that's blaringly you don't obvious. Make a scene. You don't, right. yeah, you, well, you, you, let me, you feel like, oh well. Let me tell you about a case about a mother who her, I think she saved her daughter's life eventually. Oh, we got two minutes. All right, quick story. I'm a rookie in San Gabriel. I've been on the job six months. I've just got a probation. I get a call from a lady that uh, has a dispute with her neighbor. That's all it was. I knock on the door. I talk to the woman. You know, my little girl says that guy that lives behind us in that rental house back there, um, he's kind of bothering him. Well, what do you mean? She said he bothers her. I said, well, let me talk to her alone. So I talked to her alone. Turns out this guy was luring children from the neighborhood, and this girl was about seven, uh, into his house by wrapping a dollar bill around his uh, John Thomas and saying, oh. hey, come on and take my dollar bill. And so girls, boys were all going into his house in the shower, grabbing the dollar bill, and he was molesting him, right? The girl was so young that she didn't comprehend that she was being molested as much as she thought it was a game, right? Right. And I write this whole thing up, and the detectives come in and say, well, you can't do that. That's our job. We're the detectives. So, well, it's all done. There's the guy. And the guy was sneaking out the back door while we were arguing about me not taking the case. Right. The guy was literally sneaking out the back down the street. We caught him. Um, moral of the story is that that mother called just for some mundane hunch, a feeling, an intuition. I'm mm -hmm. not saying we're all going to be, uh, you know, evasion of the body snatchers and ratting off people that think it look like aliens and things like that, right? <laughs> but, you know, your common sense and this your is, intuition and this goes... This is slippery, though. Usually, well, where you're going is I'll a little slippery. I'll tell you why it's slippery. not slippery. Because you know, by intuition, you know when something's wrong at home, right? And you're going to know yep. when something's wrong across the street. I'm not saying it looks wrong. I'm saying you feel it's wrong. It's a combination of both. 
and it you, doesn't hurt the culture. Your gut somebody. is right. The gut's yeah, almost always right. Most of the people that, and you know this as a private detective. I don't know that I agree with most that. Most of the people that come to you, like take your typical thing about, you know, whether they think the wife thinks the husband is cheating. By the time they come to you, they know. That's right. They know. 80, 85% of the women that come to me know their husband. They're, they're absolutely correct. In their suspicion. Yeah, but there are lots of cases of people who have been accused of something and been tried and put in jail for okay, it. That there are it some cases. That it turned out those instincts were not. I agree. Uh, there's some cases, but I'm not going to say it's a majority of cases. It's just not. No. The majority is they get it right most of the time, right? Now, well, well, zero minutes. We're out of time. Oh, oh, Logan, we're out of time. We have to continue right. doing this. I want to make you an offer. I want you to, when I go to five days a week, I'd love to have you on once a week giving us an update on this stuff. How about that? Let's do it. You can be our soapbox. I'm in. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Okay. Tanya, thanks for coming in. Happy Thanks Fourth of July, everybody. Thank and remember, you both. focus on serious, real things like this and not nonsense. Be safe. I'm going to relax. Oh, give me the link. <laughs>